Pompano Beach and 95.3 FM W237BD Boca Raton. The Health and Wealth Radio Network. 1470 AM and 95.3 FM. The Health and Wealth Radio Network. Listen for Invite Health with Jerry Hickey and Amanda Williams. Weekday mornings at 9. WNN. Seniors, Medicare open enrollment is quickly approaching. Call I Will Advisors for a free review of your existing health care policy and learn about all of your Medicare options. Call Debbie at 954 753 8080. 954 753 8080. Talk here. Talk there. Talk 1470 AM and 95.3 FM, the Health and Wealth Radio Network. WNN. The opinions expressed on the following sponsored program are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. It's Monday night at 9. Time for Sex Talk with Dr. Richard Siegel, a certified sex therapist and sexuality educator. Dr. Siegel is here to answer all your questions about sex and sexuality that you might not have known who to ask. He'll also welcome special guests to talk about a wide variety of topics within the fascinating world of sexuality. So, welcome to Sex Talk. Well, good evening. Welcome to Sex Talk. I'm back again with my best guest, Larry Siegel, my brother. Hello, glad to be here. Clinical sexologist extraordinaire. And we have on the screen, if you're watching live streaming on video, uh, you'll hear, if you're listening on uh, the radio, uh, our old dear friend, Dr. Hitton Sony, who's calling in from uh, Lawrence, Kansas. And Dr. Sony is a psychiatrist. Are we connected? Can you hear and see us well? Yes, I can. Terrific. Hey, we're, we're Doc. really happy to see you. It's been too long. We're delighted you could do the show with us tonight. And welcome to Sex Talk. Well, thank you for having me. It's really, really yeah. a pleasure. Um, just, the uh, you sent a bio uh, earlier today. The first line of the bio has got to be a story right there. Uh, I didn't know this about you and all the time I know you. Um, you were an environmental engineer for 10 years before you mm -hmm. went to medical school to be a psychiatrist. Now, I earlier in the promo for tonight's show described you as a unicorn already because, you know, in our world, you know, in the sex therapy world, um, uh, as I said, A, you're a psychiatrist that doesn't treat with the prescription pad. Right. B, you actually talk to your patients and counsel them. And C, you're trained in sex therapy. Right. So, you know, we thought, we were talking this afternoon, we could think of maybe the four others in the country that yeah, we know maybe so that certainly qualifies for unicorn status in our world mm -hmm. yeah. so and well, on top of that you, how did you end up th here from 10 years working in environmental engineering well very good question so i started out like most engineers i thought i knew everything <laughs> and and so i was having this um the severe back pain and it wouldn't go away. So I, I've been to all kinds of orthopedic people, even chiropractors. At one point, I tried even acupuncture and mm -hmm. Native American shamanism. And I'm willing to do anything to, to have this back pain. And one of the orthopedic surgeons kept suggesting there was nothing wrong with my back. And before he would do a surgery, I needed to go see a shrink, which made me really, really angry. It's like, I, I, I'm not crazy, you know. I, I really do have a back pain. And he goes, well, I can't just cut your back open. All the MRI, everything we do shows nothing. So it's like, I tell you what, go see a shrink, and in six months, if your back is not bad, we'll talk. Wow. And so reluctantly, I went to, to see a psychiatrist. And then the more I started uh, talking to her, my back got better. And I huh. didn't have the pain. And I, I started, from the first experience, I started paying attention to the, my inner life. And the more I talked to to my, my shrink, the, the more I was convinced that there is something else going on. And so I started, like most engineers, I want, I want to fix things myself. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the best ways to, to fix my psyche was to go to med school and, and become a shrink myself. Wow. And and Very how nice. like like our our dear departed mentor uh, Dr. Susan Lee used to love to ask everyone how did you get into sex 
Yeah. Professionally, yeah, of course. Right. How did that road yeah, take you? Yeah. So, so then I was so happy to be uh, in the med school and be doing a psychiatry bit. And, you know, we all know about Freud and how our mind is supposed to be in the gutter, about thinking about sex all the time. And so I go to the fourth year of residency, and I keep waiting, like, hey, when are you going to talk about this sex thing? Mm-hmm. And, and so as, as I come close to the fourth year, we never talked about it. Mm-hmm. And so I started seeking out uh, other wow. ways, like, what can I learn? And that's how I, I connected with you, Dr. Siegel, as you remember, that I, I came out to Florida and, and you were teaching the class and I was a third year resident and I was just so disappointed with, with my education and training that there was very little about the sexuality at all mm-hmm. being taught. And as, as my residency training was coming to an end, I was panicking. Well, somebody teach me about sex, you know? Wow. And so, so I, I ran into you and and that was a light. It, it was a very really enlightening experience to be in your class and and, and seeing what you had to, to teach. And then I was like, "Wow, this is what I sh- I really want to do." So. Mm. I really, Excellent. I really didn't know that was the uh, the spark for it. it it's, uh, yeah, it's beyond it's honored, and and just your uh, knowing you as long as we do, it's just uh, it's remarkable. Uh, I'd love to hear you talk more. Uh, briefly, because we had a, a good juicy topic f- planned for tonight, but briefly, if you would, Larry and I love to, to uh, talk to the uh, the sex docs that we know uh, about, um, well, why that sad reality mm-hmm. that nobody's being trained in medical school nor in uh, psychology uh, programs or marriage and family therapy programs. I mean, Larry and I talk about it, it seems, every week on right. this show. Or, or even OBGYN and urology programs. Yeah. I mean, the plumbing know. part, yeah, but the sex part, no. Uh, and yeah. and where the yeah, where do you think psychiatry is going so now. now with uh, uh, sexual medicine? Yeah, so now the, unfortunately, the psychiatry is now becoming a more of a, everything is about enzymes and everything yeah. is about about genes and everything is about medication and we do 15 to 20 minute management appointment it's like okay see me in 90 days mm. and and that that doesn't address the the word psyche it it, it really means a soul right mm-hmm. right i trust is a treatment and how the hell am I supposed to treat somebody's soul in 15-minute appointment and not <laughs> see them in, in, in another 90 days? It, it's beyond me. So, yeah, so it's very difficult the way the, the entire medicalization of what, what used to be in the realm of uh, yeah. the social sciences. And sure. Uh, the psychiatry, and it was supposed to be a blend between the inner experience that one has, a subjective experience, and how it relates to the, the biology, and that was supposed right. to be the whole point. But instead, we now have it completely medicalized, and we see this as a two separate realm. And in, in some, some realm, we are, we are now called providers or prescribers. Mm-hmm. Right, and it's like, well, no, I, I don't want to be a provider or a prescriber. You, you know, you have a cough. Yeah, go get a, a prescription for for whatever that you need. But when you're having a problem that's just as important as as the physical intimacy, there isn't a fifteen minute appointment with the pill. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. and and what is sex if not mind, body, and soul, and spirit? And it's in all of our institutions are just afraid of it. Mm-hmm. So speaking of uh, a, a, a sex topic that people are afraid to talk about, although like most of these things, it ends up being trendy and as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, lascivious and salacious. Right. This topic of polyamory. Mm-hmm. Now I know right. uh, Larry had a, 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 a kind of a mm-hmm. breaker uh, with this idea. Yeah, I mean, b- b- before we do, because I mean, this is a really it's a big topic for a lot of people. We hear more and more people talking about polyamory and being in polyamorous relationships. Uh, but let me just at this point say, uh, especially for anybody that is listening, you want to call in and either ask a question or uh, make a comment about maybe your experiences with, with polyamory, uh, give us a call here at 888-565-1470. Well, actually, remember, with Dr. Sony on the line, we'll need you to, to uh, type in on Facebook. 
Oh, my go bad. To, Sorry about that. If you're watching streaming on Facebook, go to the Facebook page and hit that send email. And hello, Lori. I saw you okay. sneak in there yeah. before. So, uh, so we'll have Dr. Mm-hmm. Sony on the, mm-hmm. the, the line mm-hmm. okay. for the half hour. So one of the things that I, I often ask when I hear people say, well, I'm poly. I'm in a polyamorous relationship. Uh, to be honest with you, my first question is, does your partner know? <laughs> Right? Because I think Very a lot of question. people, right? <laughs> a lot of people are using that that term, that label, to I think describe open relationships, cheating, swinging. So, as maybe a first point, uh, could you talk just a little bit about the difference between polyamory and open relationships? Yeah, absolutely. So, in an open relationship, the idea is that the either partner can have uh, whatever the sexual experience that they want without the the knowledge and the consent of your partner. But in polyamory, those two things are very, very essential. Mm -hmm. Your partner's consent and and the knowledge ahead of time. Secondly, uh, the polyamorous and the swingers are are very a little bit different in the sense that they are not necessarily wanting the experience that is limited to sexuality. So they are wanting a full uh, relationship with the birthdays and dinners and holding hands and there is this entire love aspect of it and the whole idea that it's a full-blown relationship not Mm -hmm. necessarily limited. So it's not a kink, right? It's not a paraphilia. It's not a kink. It's a lifestyle. It's a relationship choice. It's a worldview. Yeah, and then the idea that one could love more than one person whether one is having sex with both of them or not it's a different story but they are actually in love with two different people the more mm-hmm. part the love part mm-hmm. so, so when, when you talk to the poly people who are truly polyamorous they will have 99 percent of their time devoted to figuring out the rules and maybe yeah. one percent of right. time actually having sex with, with the other person because they're like well who gets what time and how do we communicate and what do we call the other person right and you didn't do mm-hmm. this and you didn't do that it's like wow you're so busy doing all this when are you actually having a fine time to have sex with one person let alone two right so or of course it could be three or, right, or four more, right. or more i heard this wonderful term only in the past couple of years a polycule like a molecule mm-hmm. but it could be a relationship of six and you right. know again yeah. it really saddens me to see that uh, in my profession in the mental health uh, in the counseling professions uh marriage and family therapy social work there's such a knee-jerk reaction uh, to pathologize this, yeah. to, to assume that there's something wrong with someone who one person isn't good enough for. Mm-hmm. Again, this very uh, moralistic kind of uh, puritanical standard. Well, it's also being yeah. stuck in an old model of relationships. Yeah, very good. And, and as Larry's pointing out, the idea that the, the, the monogamy that, that you and I have come to know in, in the 20th century, century in America and in the last few years, is this entire concept is it's really a myth. It doesn't come about until the agrarian society sits in and then we start establishing boundaries around the land that we own and this property ownership and things of that nature develop. Mm. And during the hunter-gatherers phase of our evolution, we didn't actually own anything, let alone a person. Mm-hmm. But this idea, idea of this monogamy relationship, it was more women were more. And, and I know all my feminist friends. I apologize right now. Um, women were then seen as an extension of that property, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then it's like, oh, so this is a resource that we can have to propagate our genes. And this is why then we have the sense of ownership and then putting a ring around your finger and and getting together in front of the community and say, well, this is my partner forever now. Mm-hmm. But in reality, that was never limited to sexuality. The monogamy 
the myth that we are now so accustomed to, it's truly a, a, a myth. And there's volumes written on that. Mm. When I often go and, and talk to the Kansas University, that's where the Lawrence is located. I mean, the Kansas University is located in Lawrence. And when I go to talk the, the the human sexuality class, and when I talk about this, at the end of the class, a lot of young people will come and ask, you know, I wish that my mom didn't get the divorce. And I wish that the three of them could have worked out rather than us going back and forth between stepfather and here and then using children in the custody battle right. and, and mm-hmm. ugliness and all that comes out because of this sense of property and the ownership that, that eventually extends to, to the minor children. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's an important point when you look at just the history of uh, you know how we have always looked at relationships. Uh, you know, I've, I always bristle a little bit when I hear people talking about the sanctity and the religious uh, uh, basis to marriage when it's really just it was originally a legal contract and it was about uh, as you said it was about property. I mean, a wedding ceremony really is a ritual transfer of property. Mm-hmm. So this whole idea right. of propriety that we still have in a lot of these relationships, which is why I like that distinction of, you know, a, a poly type of relationship <clears throat> is not really about sex, because in many ways that comes with this sense of propriety. But it's about the intimacy. Uh, right. It's about openness, you know, not about secrets. Right. Mm-hmm. right? So it's a consensual Consensual non-monogamy. Mm-hmm. And what we are exactly. used to is a non-consensual non-monogamy. Yeah, so cheating. When I when I go and talk in a community, I ask them, raise your hand, whether you yourself or somebody you know has had an affair, and every single hand goes up. And so, so what are these one hundred percent monogamous people? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, they, they never make it to my audience because they're never there. <laughs> Mm-hmm. When you ask, like, well, you don't have to have an affair. Do you know somebody who did? And they'll say, well, my father or my sister, mm-hmm. my brother. I mean, nobody ever raises money and goes, yeah, well, I was having an affair. You know, nobody does that. But then where are these 100% monogamous people? Mm-hmm. They, yeah. they don't exist. Right. And so I had one patient that I really was wanting to tell you. So I've changed some details, okay? So the... They are a couple in their between 50s to 60s, and they, the husband is wanting to open up the relationship and wants to engage in a polyamorous relationship. And he doesn't have anybody in mind, but he wants to. And wife is vehemently against it. Mm. Three years, they have been to numerous therapists. They eventually come and they talk, and we are talking and we are discussing what this is, what he's talking about. And during this therapy, it comes out that she's been having an affair all along. Oh, hmm. wow. And that was a secret that he just discovers. And and while she's professing to be monogamous all her and, life. And vehemently denying, mm-hmm. uh, or opposing the idea yeah. of opening so up the relationship. Husband, right. So husband feels good about it. He goes, oh, great. So you, you continue to have your boyfriend on the side. How about I go have a girlfriend? Oh, no, no. She can't have that. Hmm. So while she admits that she's in love with two two men, he couldn't do the same. Right. Yeah. He couldn't do the same, and she would she would jump up and down and say, "Well, I'm not having an affair. I'm in love with two men." Uh huh. Like, well, we we appreciate that, and you have the freedom to do so. But well, so and, we, and like Larry's point, you, yeah, you know, you you can be polyamory as long as your partner knows about it and is on board. Right. I'm mm-hmm. really glad you emphasized. I think the most important aspect to it is negotiation. Yeah, another great lesson we can learn from from uh, uh, our, our kinky clients and and friends. Uh, that the key is negotiation, and any sex therapist will tell you that. Um, one of the worst ideas is to introduce mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the the concept of opening up a relationship, opening up a marriage, to try and save that marriage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think on that point, that's that's one of those, I think, pivotal or key issues in people really going through this process to see if that's for them. Because how how does one really know that they have this inclination toward 
uh, uh, these non-monogamous relationships that they do want that intimate connection with more than one person or are they just dissatisfied with their partner where, where is that line that we can make that judgment for, for ourselves yeah great great question and, and it's you know it's so important that 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 is why what what Ricky is is teaching mm-hmm. in the, I'm sorry Dr. Siegel is teaching <laughs> Ricky in, in, in his, that taking a good history then sitting down and investing the time with your patient and then listening to them and asking them these tough questions so what I often do is meet with one partner alone meet with the other partner alone and then bring them together and mm-hmm. say, if there are some secrets, I'll honor those secrets. But let's find the courage. Let's find the courage that you bring up the secret in the therapy. Not, uh, not that I right. out your desires. Mm. You find the courage. You find the courage to say to your mm-hmm. wife that, yes, I'm attracted to other women. I want you to find the courage to say to your husband, Yes, I'm attracted to another woman or I'm attracted to another man and this is what my true sexuality is mm-hmm. and and this is what I want us to put on the table and negotiate mm-hmm. rather than resenting each other for getting in the way. Yeah. Right. Ac- ac- that's, excellent. Uh, that's why I wanted you on the show tonight, to validate everything I believe and make me jump up right. and down and go, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where well, this, this paternalism, it. this therapist, they think it's their job. First of all, um, I, I wholeheartedly agree that therapy, couples therapy, particularly sex therapy, really is effective when couples are separated. And I know it's a tough uh, issue and, you know, personal preference. A lot of especially more systemically oriented folks will refuse because it's their training, their orientation. No, the couple is my patient. I will not separate them. There's problems with that in a a number of reasons. First of all, Mm -hmm. I can't imagine telling most of the couples I see, look, you're going to go see, you both need your own individual therapist now and you're going to see three therapists a week and pay three therapists a week instead of just me. That's just crazy from the start. But also, more often than not, it seems it's the therapist's own discomfort with being in that, possibly being in that position of secret keeper. Right, holding that secret. Right, now I tell a couple, I'm going to give you your own private hour for your the the dignity and privacy to talk about your own past, your own history, without your partner necessarily sitting right there. Not an opportunity to gripe and complain about your partner behind their back. Right, which people might be defensive about. But I see so many therapists pathologize this whole idea of, uh, you know, collusion and keeping secrets and, mm-hmm. and not busting affairs. Like, uh, whose stuff is it anyway? Yeah, that's, yeah. again, something to always we have to be aware of at any every given moment. Uh, just also a reminder, anybody listening in, uh, go ahead and, and contact us on Facebook. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. Now, I want to go back to something that you had uh, said just a moment ago and I, again it's it's really really an important point this idea about negotiation but I think it's a lot of people have the wrong impression if you will that people that are in poly relationships uh, don't deal with things like jealousy and insecurity and you know I kind of see that whether you're talking about monogamous relationships or non-monogamous relationships we're talking about the same people so right. people get jealous. So in the context of you know these non-monogamous relationships, how how does one manage jealousy when it does come up? How does that get negotiated? Right. So that's a very good question. What He's good for those. Like that, that's why I'm here. Yeah, that's why I bring yeah. him around. <laughs> yeah, I, I could see why why you have him. <laughs> yeah. so My big bro. Question. One of the first thing I ask. Uh, the patient to consider, to acknowledge their jealousy first, that it is not an abnormal emotion. Mm-hmm. It is a normal emotion, acknowledge it, don't hide it, and don't take it out on the other partner, the, the resentment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So acknowledge it that it is there, know that it is a natural emotion, that, that we all experience it from time to time. Once that step is done, then we bring it honestly and openly. Mm-hmm. I often ask them 
that consider on the inside how how do you feel when your husband or your wife looks at another uh, person at the beach hmm. they are not going to go sleep with them or anything like that they're just looking at them mm-hmm. how does that feel hmm. and it doesn't feel good yeah. like oh well you you like this tall handsome muscular type of guys i uh, know honey i like your f- Fabby, <laughs> like, so, so it's like well, then acknowledge how does that feel. Right. And once you once you start with that and say well, then this is this idea of possession, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then just because you love one person, that doesn't prevent that person from having the same emotions about another person that is away from you and that is different than you. and that also doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you that you are not good enough that mm-hmm. is on the cause that other person is looking somewhere well if i was perfect and i was enough why does he need right something right so mm-hmm. that is a deficiency model like there's something wrong with me so you're seeking for or something else outside. and you know that's such an ingrained yeah. part of the culture that we see it every day i see we see people that would rather cop to some disease than admit to not having the ideal perfect marriage and that's that's troublesome mm-hmm. mm-hmm. cuz i yeah. think top of the list we know what that is it's usually porn addiction yeah. right yeah. right if yeah. i and did it for you yeah that, that's a whole uh, addiction that's like a whole other show we should do i, I know sure mm-hmm. yes we that, that's you know that's a favorite topic for us as well yeah <laughs> yeah yeah we do talk a lot about that we we just have a couple more minutes So any okay. uh, parting thoughts what would you say uh, other uh, psychiatrists and mental health providers need to uh, open their minds and and learn about non-traditional relationships and mutual non-monogamy and yeah. how to, how how to help people negotiate those Yeah absolutely so there is a there is a bible kind of a book that are out there there is a one um, it is written by our uh, ASAC uh, member and uh, what is the polyamory look like it's it's i forget her, her last name Mimi Easton oh Dossie Dossie? Easton yes yes Dossie wrote that, the ethical that, slots i have like 10 copies of that book in my <laughs> in i i my just author. got a, a review copy of the second edition i can't wait to find time to read it right right and let me say there's also another book i don't remember the author but it's called more than two which uh, uh, yeah. is also uh, a pretty good one mm-hmm. very good And, and the the one that everybody talks about is called the ethical slut. Right. right. Now right. that's not easy. It's about the name, but it, it's 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 it redefines the word slut. And yeah. the, it's just you know, and it's a very good book, and I recommend uh, that we read that with, with our patients, and I ask them that they consider reading it, and invite them to be open and honest with each other. bringing in you don't act on any of your thoughts but you just you still find the courage to bring it up right in the bedroom and open it up and discuss right. talk therapy yeah exactly indeed yeah. well yeah. music means we got to wrap it up thank mm-hmm. you dr Thanks sony so much. real we'll pleasure to talk to you we'll talk soon great to see you uh, if you need to get a hold of me you can email me at ricky at modern sex therapy.com And please uh, tune in. For, feel free to send questions during the week. We'll be here next Monday, 9 p.m. Sex Talk with Dr. Richard Siegel. Have a good week. Good night. You've been listening to Sex Talk with Dr. Richard Siegel. Join us every Monday night at 9 on WNN, 1470 AM and 95.3 FM. or watch live streaming video at Amp2 TV Productions on Facebook or look for the shows on YouTube. Thanks for tuning in and we hope you'll join us again next week.